Hello, and welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co-founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, and mentor. Today, we have a special guest, Matthew Damon, who has over 10 years of experience in finance and analytics leadership for Fortune 100 companies, and he's currently running his own residential rehab company, Broadleaf REI. Welcome to the show, Mr. Matt. How you doing, bro? Hey, good to be here, Gino. It's always good to see you, and uh, I'm excited for uh, for today's podcast. Before we jump into the podcast, we saw each other this weekend at Multifamily Mastery Five. There's over, you know, we had 1,200 tickets sold. I would say there was over a thousand people at that conference. Why don't you tell the listeners some of the takeaways, why they need to be going to conferences, and what it did for you this weekend? Yeah, so I mean, the speakers were just incredible. So we had Luke Wren there, which uh, was talking a lot about. Um, you know, taking ownership and taking life by the horns and, and really um, um, investing in yourself. Uh, that was huge. You had Pace Morby there, who was talking about, a lot about creative financing and how to deal structure and so forth. Um, just some incredible names, some incredible uh, leaders in the industry, which was um, very beneficial to hear from them to learn. Uh, and then the networking is just out of control, just some of the best networking. Um, you guys have built up a community full of, uh, you know, people that just want to uplift each other and build build each other's skills and and create relationships. Uh, there's no egos here. It's just an awesome, awesome community, um, and it's just a fantastic time. So, Matt, what I love about your story is that when you came to Jake and Gino, you had already invested thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and time into your education. Before you talk about that journey, what led you to get into the real estate space? Yeah. So for me, uh, I was working at a fortune 100 company, um, loving life, climbing the corporate ladder, had a great team, was having a lot of fun. And it was a, an instance where we had, we made a billion dollars in profit that year and we had layoffs coming to, to uh, my business unit and guys that I'd worked with for years seven years were laid off um and i saw the fear in their eyes where they weren't ready uh they didn't have passive income they had no plan in place this was their sole source of income for their families kids that parents that had kids in college kids late in high school and that fear it just resonated with me um i was having my first child and uh i said you know what i gotta be ready for this because it's gonna be me in 15 years i gotta be totally prepared to be laid off so it was all about like this passive income journey um, and, and starting to embark on that. And that's love, a big piece of our story. I love that. That's the trigger event, everybody. I challenge everyone who's listening to this right now. Do you have a trigger event? I mean, the event that really changed your 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 life. I mean, it's funny because Matt's belief was, I've got a great job. I love what I'm doing here. But then all of a sudden, this company's making a lot of money and it's all about corporate profits. It's all about the next quarter. And am I going to be the next person that's going to be laid off? And he, you wanted control, Matt. So what led you to the single family space? So, you know, we knew we could afford to buy duplexes in our area. And so our, our goal and our journey was we're going to save a bunch of money. We're going to buy one duplex a year. We're going to, uh, if we can do that within five years, we felt like our duplexes would be buying duplexes. We didn't need the cash. We were just going to set it aside. Um, but then the opportunity to scale and seeing what some other people were doing and, and how, how much more, like if you, if you invest in multifamily, there's just so much more. Uh, potential for earnings, higher earnings and uh, appreciation and so forth. We just felt like that was the right place to be long term. And how did you start off that journey in, in real estate, the single family journey? Yeah, so we we bought a duplex um, in Massachusetts. So it's a place where it's not um, as landlord friendly as other states, but it's not super tenant friendly, somewhere a little bit in the middle. Um, we, we renovated the whole thing and we ended up refinancing and getting a huge chunk of our cash back. Uh, we made all the mistakes you could make um, along the journey, and it was it was it was then we realized, oh my gosh, we need to start. We need to invest in our education. We have no systems in place. We have no tools. Working a full time uh, full time job, um, doing this nights and weekends, early mornings, um, and that's when we, we realized if we don't invest in uh, education, we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> As Bill Ham says, you can either learn on the street or you can learn in the classroom. Learning on the streets a lot more expensive. I've learned that lesson. I, it sounds like you've learned the lesson. So you go on and you start, you know, getting into the single family home space education, and you're taking that dive. And then, what makes you want to get into multifamily? So uh, 
so what makes us want to get into multifamily is really we we, we kind of stumbled into it, um, to be honest. I mean, we were starting to do bigger and bigger deals, chasing after more and more cash flow. But we had the opportunity uh, to buy um, a seven family building that um, was bigger than anything we had done so far. Uh, and it was here that we learned the power of multifamily. So it's it's something that's based on income as opposed to sales comps and so forth. So we bought a building that was completely boarded up. Uh, someone had tried to flip it um, or renovate it and they had failed and we were excelling in this area. We were on something like our 20 something rehab at this point. Um, you know, we had done uh, several million dollars worth of renovation uh, budgets over over the last three years. So we were like, okay, we're ready to take on a bigger project. Um, fast forward five, six months later, and we're today, we're doing a cash out refinance, returning 85% of our investor capital uh, back from that project. Wow. So when you started out, Matt, were you buying homes, holding them and flipping them as well? Buying duplexes, holding some and flipping some as well? Yeah. So after that first duplex, someone had approached us. We were pretty much out of cash at that point. And they said, Hey, do you flip, do you flip uh, houses? And, you know, I said, of course we do. I needed to earn some more income to buy more duplexes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we got into flipping single family houses in order to buy more like duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it kind of took a, a turn of its own and took on a life of its own. We didn't, I never thought we'd go this direction. Um, but, you know, after flipping the first house, uh, the, the single family, uh, we bought another duplex and then we flipped another single family and then another single family and then bought a quadplex, you know, and it became this journey that was like, wow, this is actually really interesting. We learned at a time right in the middle of COVID when you couldn't make a mistake uh, because the market was appreciating so quickly that uh, we were very fortunate on our timing um, and learning the lessons we were able to learn very quickly in a time where... Uh, you know, appreciation covered us. So uh, that was super, super valuable. You had said, I didn't expect the journey to take me this way. Where did you expect the journey to take you? Yeah, I expected to stay in my corporate job and and, and continue to, to do that for another 20, 30 years. And I mean, I wasn't unhappy. Um, but it was when I started earning a lot more in real estate than I was earning in my day job, you know, working for a fortune 100 company in management, you know, I was mm -hmm. like, wow, this is, uh, this is fascinating. And then, it, you know, it's funny, I flipped a house and I made, you know, 50 grand the same day I got my 3% raise. And I was like, which one was more impactful, right? My 3% raise of, you know, a couple grand and versus that, you know, it just, it just made me, made me realize the power of real estate and how it was limitless. Um, the more we got into it, uh, you know, we, the more we were able to kind of earn whatever we, 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 we wanted to earn. How was the conversation with your wife and with your family members saying, hey, I'm leaving this job and I'm going into real estate full time? Yeah, so that is a really good question. So I, I think we did it. I think we did it uh, in a way that's very intelligent. So for two years, I ran in parallel. So we, we did both, you know, we had some passive income coming in from, you know, our rental properties. We had some uh, flips under our belt. We had actually saved up a year's worth of income. Um, and we just we just grinded for two years. Once we had the year's worth of income set up, we, were, we knew we could always fall back on, hey, listen, go get another job, that kind of thing. And we had a pipeline of projects that were underway. So we felt pretty confident. But again, that's a huge leap. You know, every sort of fear comes into your mind. I had two young girls, still have two young girls, uh, two young, two young babies at home that, you know, it's my job to take care of them and make sure they have food on their table, uh, you know, and a roof over their heads and so forth. And so it was definitely, uh, it was definitely a scary move, but, uh, um, you know, it was one that I'm so happy we took and I'm so happy to have, you know, I'm thankful for my wife's support in that. Um, it, it certainly, it certainly changed our world. Matt, if I'm listening to this right now and I'm on the cusp or, or I want to really, let's break it down to two questions. I am a person who's just starting out and I just not thrilled with my job. I want what you have. I want that control. Can you give me a, a roadmap for that person since you were that person? And then can you give me the roadmap for the person who's pretty close to leaving and he still or she still has those limiting beliefs about I really need this corporate job. It's It's really risky to do it full time. Yeah. So, I mean, my, my attitude with this is to stay in your W2 job as long as you can, 
um, and use that as a tool to get ahead. Because if you don't need to rely on that passive income that you're coming in or the, or the flip income, if you're flipping, um, that allows you to scale so much faster because all of your bills are being paid by another job. Now it's, it's a grind. You're going to work nights and weekends. You're going to hustle. Um, but, but the longer you can stay in your, your, uh, W2 job, the, uh, the longer, the, the faster you're going to be able to scale, um, you know, up your business. I would also say it helps you to, to avoid some of the mistakes that a lot of people are making with the hands-on approach. When you are working at a 40 hour plus, uh, job, you can't be out banging nails and painting walls and doing all the stuff. You can't do it. You don't have time, right? So, so you actually set up things the, the proper way to do it. You, you're hiring the right people. You're hiring, doing the right process. Um, and so it allows you to, to sidestep a lot of the mistakes that amateurs get stuck in. Um, if you're the individual that is, you know, you've had some success, you have some passive income, you're ready to leave your job, you know, Take a look at your finances to, you know, is it, are you in a place where you think you cover the cost? Uh, if you step out there, opportunity is everywhere. You will be successful. Uh, if you put your nose to the grindstone, make smart decisions, surround yourself with, with coaches, um, and it, it be able to pick up the phone and ask for, you know, other people to review your deals and so forth before you actually make them, you're, you're, you're going to help sidestep and shortcut the process, uh, and avoid a lot of mistakes. And I think you can do it. Um, it's not necessarily easy, but it's definitely rewarding. Uh, it's hugely rewarding. What I would add to that, Matt, and, and to all the listeners, I'm reading a book called MindWorks. And where you put your awareness and where you put your focus on is, is where you excel. When you're doing your W-2 job, your focus is 40 hours a week on the job. And then the remaining should be on the family and education and the deals. So there's less awareness, less focus on that. When you ultimately do leave your W-2 job and you've got some kind of portfolio, you've got some kind of, all of a sudden, as Matt said, there's opportunities around. Those opportunities were always there. We just weren't aware of them because our, our focus, our reticulator activating system is not focused on that. You're focused on, you know, get making corporate profits. You're focused on the, the meeting in the morning. You're focused on taking your kids to school. But when you're doing this full time, that's why it's a gradual process because Jake and myself did the same thing. I started investing with Jake in 2011. We bought our first deal in 2013, 18 months later. And three years later, I left my job. I left the restaurant. So I was using the the, the, the job, the restaurant, that income to qualify for loans, to pay for my, my expenses and the conveyor belt. What Matt is really, really referring to is Think of a conveyor belt in front of you. We call it the conveyor belt theory, where you're putting deals on the conveyor belt and Matt's putting a house on there, a fix and flip. It's going to matriculation. He's pulling the equity out, selling it. Then he's buying a duplex. Now the duplex is on the conveyor belt. He's refining that duplex and putting, and does it take a little bit of time? Absolutely. But can you actually honestly say to yourself, if I have to sacrifice the next two years to put in the grind and within the next five years, I'm completely financially free doing what I love to do. Is that a lot of time? To me, it wasn't. I mean, how about to you, Matt? Let me know when it was that you said to yourself that feeling, that moment when you, where were you when you said, I, I'm done, I can leave? Yeah, so for, for me, it was two years into my journey. Uh, we had about eight units under our belt. We were bringing in enough to cover our mortgage. And, and New England is, a, is is an expensive area to live in the country. Um, you know, we weren't, we didn't, we, we had big bills. And so- you know, with our with our mortgage being covered by passive income, with deals in the pipeline, that was at the time we felt like, okay, we can actually step away from this. But feel do you have a specific moment? Like, I'll share you mine. My time was in August of 2015. I am in the shed. And for those of you who are on YouTube, I've got my phone to my ears. And, and I'm doing pretty good with it, Jake, where we've got enough deals. We've got a decent amount of cash flow. I'm doing $12 an hour work. I'm putting bags of flour away. I'm putting in those tomato cans. And I ultimately said to myself, I'm negotiating an $11 million deal with Jake right now. This deal could set me free for the rest of my life and probably set my kids free for the rest of my life. What am I doing this work for? That's the fear. That's the doubt. Those are the limiting beliefs. That's the awareness that I should be focusing on this deal and not doing this $12 an hour work. I was comfortable and, and I didn't understand the power that if I left, that was the seminal moment for me. And I said, I'm out of here. I, I need to make the challenge. It took me another three months before I left the restaurant. You know, during the week, I still worked on the weekends with my brother, but a total of six months. But I made the decision that day, putting away bags of flour that I am leaving the restaurant and I'm going to do this full time. Do you have a moment in your mind when that happened for you? 
for me, it was that raise when I got that raise, that 3% raise. And I was like, this is embarrassing. <laughs> like I'm, I'm the finance guy for this company. I know what kind of money we're making. You gotta be kidding me. And it was my worst raise I had gotten in five years. You know, I had gotten double that for the every year. And, and then, you know, under this, uh, under this, you know, new leadership, I got that 3% raise and they were telling me how awesome it was. And I was like, this is not, there's nothing awesome about this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome for you and awesome for the bottom line, but not awesome for me. Right. That's, right. that's huge. I love that. And remember everybody, what's your seminal moment as you're, as you're going down the journey with Matt, the journey with Matt is all of a sudden he lost control. He didn't, he didn't feel like he had control. He didn't have that safety and the security that has to come. That, that has to be really real with the person who's going to start getting educated and start taking action. Then all of a sudden that seminal moment, when you finally get there and say, Hmm, this ain't for me. 3% not for me. I'm not washing toilets. I'm actually I'm actually doing some amazing work here and then they're not valuing me for my work. And now I understand if the company's struggling or we're doing layoffs and that's one thing, but if they're making a billion dollars and it's not always about the money, it's just about being appreciated. No, when you're at that point before you joined Jake and Gino, what were the struggles you were having uh before you joined the educate uh, joined the community to get into multifamily? Yeah, so so you know Multifamily is anything that's over five units and over. And so I was very much stuck in the residential space. I did not understand commercial financing. Didn't think I could do it. Very much had limiting beliefs that I wasn't skilled enough to do it, that I couldn't raise the capital to do it. Uh, you know, we had, we had, you know, some success, but we had not raised, you know, uh, the money we felt like to buy 10, 15 units. We're in the process right now of buying 13 units, right? I, yeah, speaking of limiting beliefs, I didn't think we could do that, right? That scared me. Like, I always felt like I needed things to be within my control and, and to keep things small. But I mean, I've heard some people say, and I think, Gino, you said it multiple times that like, you know, you're able to, uh, it, it, there's, there's this limiting belief that like, if you can't, I don't know, I don't know where I'm going, but basically I felt like I, I just couldn't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the effort, which is what you said many times is the effort needed to buy a duplex, maybe the same as the effort needed to buy 20, 30, 40 units. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that to me was what is one of those limiting beliefs. I want to share with, with the listeners also, I'm pretty friendly with, with Matt. Why? Because Matt joined the community and he didn't disappear. Matt has actually come to the boot camps. He's sat down. He's networked with the community. And I think when you start surrounding yourself with amazing people that, you know, Luke Wren says about it, proximity is power. All of a sudden you say to yourself, hmm, how can that person do 30 units? Why can't I do it? And it's not from a jealousy perspective. It's from a, I don't want to say an admiration perspective, but it's like, wow, she did it. I, I can do it as well. And it's that limiting belief that you don't see anyone else doing it around you. You have that. Then all of a sudden you start making connections and relationships with, within the community. And then all of a sudden you're at a Vanilla Ice concert on a Saturday night and you're hanging out with people and drinking beers. And these are the people that you want to partner with. These are your friends, lifelong friendships that you're making. It's not just about real estate. And then what Matt has done, Matt has gone through a transformation. He hasn't changed the person he is. He's still the same person he is. All he does is he's transformed his life and the journey is going to continue because we're talking about 13 units now. Next year, we're going to be talking about 30 units. And the following year, it's going to be 70 units. And the following year, it's going to be 200 unit deals. So it's just a process of really jumping in there and not worrying about what's going to happen five years from now. We need to have those goals five, five years from now. Absolutely. But what most of us do is they can't imagine themselves doing a 20 unit. Think big. Start small. I will promise you, as Jake and I have said, even at MM5 at, at that live event, we're talking about the snowball effect. That snowball effect is real. You're listening to Matt, who all of a sudden has got the snowball effect, buying single families, turning them into duplexes, then a seven unit, now a 13 unit. And if he had stayed back years ago and said, I, I can't do this, I, I have those limiting beliefs. And I don't want to take the credit for joining Jake and Gino, but I think him seeing people doing it, even in a tough market, even during COVID, we can make all those excuses. And we have, and I have as well. But I think right now is a, such an opportune time to get into multifamily because you see what's happening with Bitcoin, what's happening with the stock market, what's happening with the economy. People need a place to live and it's an amazing vehicle. I mean, you want to add anything to that, Matt? No, the community is, I think is so important. Who you surround yourself matters. Uh, the ability to pick up the phone with almost any Jake and Gino member and just say, hey, I got a question. You, you, you're you somewhere, someone who's further down the road than me. Can you help me get from A to B here? People are so willing to help. I mean, that's mm -hmm. something that is just so helpful. The training programs, uh, the tools, 
literally today I, I'm in downloading some of the documents because we're taking over this 13 unit building. And I'm like, we don't necessarily have, we haven't built out everything that you guys already have that's available to us. So I'm like, let's go in and download our takeover documents, start like customizing this for our team. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going through that and that is hugely helpful. I hear in your future, you need to have a couple of phone calls with our property manager coaches. I'm just saying that that's the ability to be at, get on there and we talk about buy right, yep. finance right, and manage right. You may not need them in the first 20 or 30 units, but now as you're talking about it, we have you know an expanded takeover doc where you can walk through with them and make sure that you know you're going through it because now all of a sudden you want to start systemizing your takeovers because you're going to be expanding your team. This is stuff you don't need early on. You should probably be using a property log for every single one of your properties. You're going to have that. You're probably going to start creating a weekly, you know, meeting with all of your em employees and all your team members and contractors and if you're using third-party property management. So this is all stuff as you're starting to grow. Don't worry about it when you when you get into it. Just know that those tools are available in the community as you start growing. That's what that's where the value is. So I'm going to have to connect you with Jennifer after we get off the podcast because it's going to be hugely important. Because once you take over, there's processes that need to go. And then as you're starting to build, it's better to get it on the front end than getting it on the back end. Yeah. Do you do you have any uh, thoughts about that seven unit? How you know if you can share with the listeners, what did you do with that? How did you find the deal? How did you add value to it? And what did that look like? Yeah, so tons tons of networking. That was a big piece of this. It's just getting out and networking and building our brand um, was hugely important. Uh, we 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 came across um, a property from a wholesaler. It was seven units. It was boarded up. It was someone who had tried to flip it, but you know they just weren't in the market. They weren't local. We were we were able to take it. We were able to take it. Put about two hundred twenty thousand dollars into renovating it. We used bridge debt for it. Um, and we were able to get the property fully stabilized, rented at top dollar, just beautiful apartments that are in great condition. Um, we were able, actually able to push a lot of the costs, create a better housing experience, push a lot of the costs off the landlord or onto the tenants um, by switching up some of the heating systems, doing electric baseboard and so forth, um, which gave you know them better uh, control of their heat and so forth. So they're able to live in a better house and saved us and boosted NOI significantly. So a bunch of decisions like that. Um, and we're returning 85% of the capital at the end of the day. And we have a pro a property that's going to cash flow really, really well, just a cash cow. And that was a nice base hit to get us going. And that brought on the 13 unit. We raised $650,000, uh, last month for that. That's a number that I never thought we could touch. I never thought we'd be even close to that. We have a 17 unit after this that's that's kind of queued up and we're just starting to take down more and more projects. When you said 30 units, yes, for next year, I'm thinking, yeah, no, we're going to take on more than 100. Um, 2019, I had zero units. Next year, I'll have over 100 by the end of next year. I and everybody, these are valuable cash flowing profit per unit assets. This is not stuff that he's going out and farming. This is money that's coming to him and his and his limited partners out there. So that's what the amazing part is. You don't need to go out and buy 300 units on a deal. If you're buying, that's this is our strategy. We want to be the small giants. It sounds as if Matt wants to be the small giants out there where he's buying really quality deals in his market. He's looking for the value. And this is a testament to his experience and his education and his understanding. He knows his market really well. He knows where values are. He knows what 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 to buy, right? He knows how to actually add value onto the properties. And then he's financing them with bridge debt and then refining the money out and returning it to his investors. So it doesn't happen overnight, but he's gotten clarity from the start. And it was great. And I'm, I'm sure people ask you, well, would it have been better to start multifamily and skip single family? I'd love to hear your answer. I mean, I have my, my own thoughts about that, but what are your what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yes, it would have been. Do I think I would have started there? I think to, to me that I needed I needed the stepping stone of starting in, in single family. But I think that the better strategy would be just jump right in, right? Partner with the right people. Just jump right in. Learn as much as you can. Focus on education, but take action. Don't don't let limiting beliefs get in the way to say you can't do it. Uh, certainly have your deals reviewed by people that are experts, people that have been down the path, make sure you're making the right financial decision because it's it's a big financial decision. Uh, but once you once once you find the right deal and go down that path, it's definitely worthwhile. It's it's hugely worthwhile. Before we sign off, Matt, I, one question I really want to ask you, what is your life going to look like in five years? Are you, are you going to continue to expand in your market, go out of market? What does that look like for you? 
I definitely going to expand out of my market. Um, we we're in we're in a really great market. Uh, from the standpoint of we have a city that's a half an hour from us that's growing tremendously. High high biotech high tech jobs are coming into this area um, in leaps and bounds, and so it's it's a great place to invest now. But in the long term, I definitely want to be in places that are far more landlord friendly. I'll still continue to operate the properties we have here, but it's definitely going to be, um, you know, focusing on investing with others in other markets. I love that, everybody. What Matt's done is he's bought some really quality assets next to him. He's learned how to buy right in that market, and he understands the market. And now that he's got his little portfolio of 100 units, that's his little cash cow right there. His little baby money soldiers are starting to produce more baby money soldiers. And all of a sudden, he says, at one point in my life, next year, next three years, I'm going to step out of the market. And I'm going to go look at other markets because I already understand that that understanding of here. And it'll be easier for me to raise money because I've got some experience. Elon Musk says, at first, they laugh at you. And then they will applaud you. I'm sure when you told your bosses, I'll see you later, they're like, I don't know about that. They start laughing. But now they probably look back and they're going to say to themselves, how do I get in on this, this real estate thing? This is pretty interesting. Have you had that experience yet? I have a chip on my shoulder because someone made a comment to me that I was going to go broke trying to do this. And uh, so, so it's kind of fueled me. It's one of those things you think of like Tom Brady and so forth, the things that fuel him. It's the, the negative thing someone said to you that has fueled you to be like, go that extra mile and make it happen. Uh, it's, that's one of those, that's one of those things that, cause it was someone that I, I respected. <laughs> that is awesome. Let that. me try, let me try to recap this, uh, this podcast. And then afterwards, I'll just final, final thoughts from you and, and uh, let you let where the listeners can get a hold of you. But for everybody real, I mean, when you think about Matt Damon, he's out there, he's hustling, he's working for a fortune 100 company. He's grinding it. He's doing well. He likes his job. But then all of a sudden he sees that his company's making a billion dollars and they're laying people off. That wasn't the final you know, straw that broke the camel's back. The final straw was the 3% raise. And for those of you out there, do you have that trigger event, that, that event that really wants, puts, you know, lights a fire under your ass, that lit a fire in their mats. And he said, I need to figure something out. But what he did is he went out and started in a single family space, made a couple of mistakes, said, I need to get some education because I went to college for four years. <laughs> Why shouldn't I go out and invest in education in single families? And he did. And all of a sudden, after putting the hard work, those two years of grinding and people telling him you can't do it, he became financially free. But he knew out there that all of a sudden he wanted to scale up into bigger properties. And what he did, he didn't rest on his laurels. He says, I need to go make another significant investment in my education because right now it's not an expense. An expense is something that you pay. And you, you, know, you, may, you may get something back. But an investment is something where you're adding value to yourself and you're carrying it forward forever, making that investment. But also, as you've heard throughout, it's not easy. There's a lot of work, continuing to reinvest in yourself, continuing to invest in your education, in your relationships. All of that matters tremendously. And then taking action, putting all that together, taking action and having a plan for yourself. You know, people are out there saying, hey, you need to go out and buy these huge deals. Matt's like, I, I don't need the big deals. I'm, I like these smaller deals right now. I'm, I'm building my cash snowball machine right now. Once I have that stabilized, then I can step outside. So um, it's it's an honor to have him as part of the community because he's a real great example of putting in, a, what, putting in a lot of work and becoming clear on your goals, what that can lead to in a real short amount of time. Matt, do you want to add anything before we sign off? Yeah, the only thing I'd add is is you know the importance of time blocking. If you if you have a big goal, time block. It's so important. Yeah, you need to have a time block that nothing can get in the way of that. Um, it's if 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 you have that, you'll be uh, well on your way. And then the other piece that you said before is uh, this power and proximity. So surround yourself with the right people. Network. Oh, I love that. How can the listeners get a hold of you? Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Broadleaf R E I Boston. Um, or, or reach out to me on LinkedIn, Matthew Damon. I want to thank Matt for coming on the show and sharing his story. Now, if you want to be the next Movers and Shakers guest, email mckenzie at jakeandgina.com. And if you like the show, please leave us a review. Until next time, let's go out there and make it a Movers and Shakers week. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.